Well, I'm not planning to get ill. That's only going to arise if I have any problems. So, should I just go along when I arrive? That's what we recommend for peace of mind. But it's not compulsory, and if you don't live inside the catchment area, you can't, in fact, register there. Where do you live? Well, at the moment, I'm staying at the Backpackers Hostel in Hill Street, but I will be moving from there shortly, somewhere nearer. Well, there's a map at the centre which shows you the area that the university practice can accept people from. It's what we call the yellow zone. If you live outside that area, you have to find another medical centre to register with. It sounds like I'll only qualify after I move. I think you might be right. Then, in addition to the health centre, there's a free counselling service for all students situated on the North Campus. You don't have to register. They also have drop-in sessions. I say it's free, but that's only for up to eight sessions. Beyond that, they normally refer people elsewhere. Sounds serious. Well, it's not just for big problems. People go there for advice on housing, workload, whatever, really. They can even arrange financial help. Mm. Uh, is it confidential? Absolutely. Then again, a lot of students prefer to phone the Nightline service, which is run from an office on the central campus. They don't really encourage people to drop in. I see. So it's basically a free phone line. The number, if you want to make a note, is 0900 762 5913. I'll say it again. 0900 762 5913. Fine. Well, I hope I won't need any of these. What I will want is access to some gym facilities. Right. Well, you'll find those on the south campus in the sports centre. It's great, but it's not free. You have to present your student card and pay a fee of £22 to get a pass, but that will last you for the whole year. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 6 to 10. Is this information on the website? I'm afraid not. I can send you some leaflets or even resend the whole information pack if you give me your details. Uh, could you send the whole information pack, please? Yes, that's fine. I'll have to take down some details. Could you tell me your full name? Sonia Orr. S O N Y. Uh, no, I'll spell it. S O N I A. Then or is O R R. Or. Okay. And you said you were on Hills Road? Yes, but don't send it there as I'm about to move. I'll give you my new address, which is 22 Winter Gardens. That's Glenfield. And the postcode? Oh, yeah. That's GF23 9BQ. Fine. Now, we're doing a bit of data collection about who uses our services at the moment. Can I just ask a few more questions? Yes, that's fine. OK. If you're an international student, what country are you from? I'm from Switzerland. And how old are you? I'm 24. And finally, which course are you enrolled on? Right. Well, that's a bit complicated, since I'm hoping to switch to economics and history. But at the moment... I'm down to do economics and sociology. It's a joint degree. OK, I'll put that. Great. Well, I'll pop the information pack in the post, and you should get it soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear part of a lecture on art and culture in the Indonesian island of Bali. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Last week, we looked at the traditional art of Japan. In this week's lecture, we're going to move south and look at the very special way in which art has developed in the beautiful island of Bali, which is now part of Indonesia. I'll begin by giving you a brief historical overview. It's thought that the first inhabitants of Bali were farmers who arrived around 3000 BC, at the beginning of the Iron Age. They probably originally came from China, and in Bali they cultivated rice and built temples ornamented with wood and stone carvings and statues. The Hindu religion was introduced in the 14th century AD, and this has remained the main religion on the island. This was an important period in the artistic development of the island, when sculptors, poets, priests and painters worked together in the service of the ruling families. Rather than painting everyday scenes, artists concentrated on narrative paintings illustrating the epic stories of Hinduism. Bali's rich natural resources have always made it an alluring goal for merchants, and from the 17th century onwards, Dutch ships visited the island to trade in spices and luxury goods. Gradually, the old royal families lost their power, and eventually, in 1906, the Dutch East Indies Company was founded, and the island became a colony. In the 20th century, art then took on a very different role, as a tool accessible to everyone in the fight of the Balinese people against colonization, rather than as the property of a minority. Shortly after this, in the 1920s, stories of the beauty of the island of Bali began to spread around the world, and Balinese art underwent another vast transformation with the advent of tourism to the island. At first, this was only on a small scale, but it had important effects. Expatriate artists from Holland and Germany settled on the island, bringing paper, Chinese ink and other new materials with them. They worked with local artists, encouraging them to experiment with concepts like naturalism, expressionism, light and perspective, as well as to move away from the traditional focus on narrative painting towards something closer to their own experience. When independence came in 1945, this desire for an art to match a new national identity became stronger and the traditional narrative paintings started to give way to scenes showing the everyday life of the Balinese people, harvests, market scenes and daily tasks, as well as the myths and legends of their history. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Many of the features that give this art its special place in the world today can be traced back to these historical roots. One feature that is rooted in the events of the last century is that today in Bali the production and the appreciation of art is not restricted to a minority. In fact, there is a famous saying that in Bali... Everyone is an artist. And it's not considered that to make art or talk about art, any formal training is needed. 
Art is just produced as part of Balinese life. Even fruit salad is served with flowers strewn on top. One factor which has contributed to this productivity is Bali's fertility. Over the centuries, the rich soil and the fact that food and shelter are readily available has given the islanders the leisure to develop their arts. While painting, sculpture, carving, and music have traditionally been the province of men, women have channeled their creative energy into making lavish offerings to the gods with spectacular pyramids of flowers, fruit, and cakes offered at the temples on festival days and celebrations. All these kinds of art still have close links with the religion of the people and are something that people do on a daily basis. Another special characteristic of art in Bali is that it is not generally seen as an individual pursuit. In the West, art is often carried out by the artist on his own, reflecting his own individual world view in the hope of achieving personal wealth and fame. For Balinese artists, art is something that's done as a group, and many artists may participate in one piece of work. And Balinese art is not restricted to temples and offerings; it decorates objects such as jackets, motorcycles, hotel menus, and so on. But perhaps the most significant characteristic of Balinese art, and one that distinguishes it most from the art of the West, is to do with its expected lifespan. Carvings are made in soft stone, which is gradually destroyed over the years. The humid climate rots paper and cloth paintings. The magnificent offerings of fruit and sweets are eaten. Wooden statues are destroyed by insects. But Balinese artists accept that their work is ephemeral, not permanent, and instead of slavishly preserving the originals, they produce new art. And all this rebuilding, renovating, and replacing means that the island's art continually evolves and perpetuates itself. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a conversation between a potential student at Clevedon College and a representative in the Information Centre. Station. First, you have some time to look at questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Now listen carefully and answer questions twenty-one to twenty-four. Good morning, Clevedon College. Can I help you? Yes, please. I'd like some information about evening courses this term. Okay. Which subjects are you interested in? Two subjects, actually: languages and computer skills. Okay. What languages are you interested in? Actually, I'm not sure. I have to fulfil a language requirement for school. But I haven't really decided what language to study.、Mm, how many language courses do you run each week? We have two every night, from Monday to Friday. I'm sorry, but would you mind going through the schedule for me?、Mm, which language on which days? Not at all. Monday to Wednesday are modern European languages: French, Spanish, German, Dutch, and Polish. Thursday night we offer ancient languages, Latin and ancient Greek, and on Friday we finish off with the Asian languages of Hindi and Bengali. 
Monday to Wednesday, Modern European. Thursday, Ancient Languages, and Friday, Asian. Can you spell Bengali, please? Yes, it's B E N G A L I. Great. And how much do the courses cost? Each course costs twenty-five pound per person per term. But if you want to do two language courses, there's a ten percent discount. But only if you book for two terms. So the ten percent discount is if I take two courses for two terms. Is that right? Right. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions twenty-five to thirty. Now listen and answer questions twenty-five to thirty. Would it be possible for me to book my classes right now? No, sorry, the computer's down. What I suggest you do is call extension nine six nine four. Oh no, sorry, six nine nine four after six p.m. and ask for Mrs. Johnson. I'm sorry. I didn't get that. Did you say six nine nine four after six p.m.? Yes, six nine nine four. Please ask for Mrs. Johnson. Thanks. Okay. Can we now look at the computer skill courses? Yes, of course. Computer classes always start in the first week of the month. And the way it works is we offer one computer class for the entire month. So you might spend one month on databases, another month on Excel, and so on. Classes meet once a week on Tuesday afternoons. The next class starts February first. Okay, so for the upcoming month, February. February is going to be databases. There are twenty-four places still free on that course, and it costs forty pound per person. February. Databases, twenty-four openings, forty pounds. Okay. Excel starts in March, and that's nearly full. Only four slots left. It's forty-five pounds. Okay, Excel, March, only four slots left. Got it. April is Outlook. That is never as popular since it costs so much more, but you get a free CD. It is sixty pound for the month. And there are nineteen places left. Okay, April, Outlook, sixty pounds. Is that it? No. On the third of June, we start a word course. We have sixteen vacancies for that at the moment. It's also expensive at fifty-five pounds. Third of June, word, sixteen vacancies, fifty-five pounds. Now, do I call the same number to book a place in one of these classes? No, you have to call Mary Jones. I think yes, Mary Jones, extension nine six two three. Sorry, could you repeat that number? Yes, extension nine six two three. Please call her before six p.m. Okay. Many thanks for all your help. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part four.
Part 4. We're going to hear a talk on wild rice. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen to the tape and answer the questions. Good morning. Today we'd like to talk about wild rice. Contrary to what many people believe, wild rice is not rice at all, but a grass. Much of it sold in the world today is not even wild, but rather cultivated varieties that do not occur naturally. Wild rice is really an annual aquatic seed, found mostly in the upper freshwater lakes of Canada, Michigan, Wisconsin and Minnesota in North America. Indians gathered wild rice before any explorers set foot on the North American continent. Early explorers were greatly impressed with the strength and hardiness of the woodland Indians and attributed their vitality to their ample servings of wild rice. Wild rice can grow in water as shallow as three or four feet along marshes and muddy waters. A tall plant, it grows to a height of eight to ten feet, with a long flower cluster that reminds one of a narrow broom. The grains in their husks on the tall stalk looks somewhat like oats. Truly wild rice is a challenging crop to grow. Even today, it's very susceptible to failure due to weather conditions. If a heavy windstorm comes along just before harvesting, the seeds can be blown into the water, ruining an entire crop. Harvesting at just the right time becomes a matter of beating the birds to it since wild rice is considered a delicacy by many birds living in the area. Other challenges include insects, disease, poor drainage and high waters. If the grains are too green, they are difficult to thresh or beat out of their husks. If left on the plant too long, even a few days too long, they fall off the plant into the water. Airboats have brought about recent improvements in commercial harvesting of the wild rice, while newer techniques for parching, winnowing and hulling have been a help in saving time and labour. Still, it takes about three pounds of grass seed to yield one pound of wild rice. Buyers should be aware of two types of wild rice, gathered and commercial. Foraged or hand-harvested wild rice is gradually being pushed out of the market by hybrid commercial varieties. Hand-harvested wild rice makes up less than 20% of the market today. Heirloom varieties of this foraged grain still exist. In fact, it is the only heirloom grain sold commercially. However, package labels can be deceiving. Though the label may read Indian harvested or organic, the product may be hybridised wild rice placed in freshwater lakes and gathered by Indians in airboats. Hand harvested, organic and from the Great Lakes region is the real thing with superior flavour and aroma, but it may be difficult to find. Though wild rice is one of the most expensive grains, it goes a long way. Some say that one pound of the grain can feed 30 people. To compensate for its high cost, try combining wild rice half and half with brown rice. For a truly colourful presentation, try one third of each, white rice, brown rice and wild rice. That is the end of 